Hey, Bastish B here for 64K and welcome to my new series, Shoot 'em Up Decades. So you're probably wondering, what is this new show going to be about? Okay, so on each episode, I'm going to highlight three classic shoot 'em ups from three different decades. It's going to be chosen at random, whether it's 70s, 80s, 90s, or the nows. It's meant to show the progression of the whole shoot 'em up genre. You get to see like ones from different decades and how they've changed. So that's the whole goal of this. If you like shoot 'em up games, classic horizontal vertical scrolling shoot 'em ups, you're really going to like this show. So let's not waste any more time here. Let's jump to our first game for today, and that's from 1987. by Houston was released in 1987 on the Commodore 64. And as we just heard, Zynapse was released by the powerhouse UK software company at the time, Houston Consultants, who were a major player in the European 8 and 16-bit computer scenes at the time. They started making games in 1981 and closed their doors in 1991, but they are fondly remembered for producing some excellent games, mostly shoot 'em ups that pushed the hardware of the time to the limit. Games such as Nebulous, Stormlord, Cybernoid 1 and 2, and Iridium were just a few of their gems. But Zynapse was wedged almost in the middle of their whole software cycle and is often overlooked due to the popularity of those titles. Zynapse is a classic styled horizontal shooter that takes all the right cliches at the time but does them all very well. Designed by John Cummings who worked on many C64 classics such as Fire Lord, Soldier of Fortune, not to mention doing brilliant work on arcade conversions like Super Off-Road, Rainbow Island and let's not forget Stun Car Racer, the game was in good hands. Zynapse features 12 levels of relentless action that is going to really push any fan of the genre to the limit, to say the least. Hard is an understatement, but the more you play it, the easier it gets. Okay. Well, until you get to the next level, that is. The levels are generally pretty short, with a boss at the end of each of them. But if you die, you go all the way back to the beginning of the level. Yep, it's one of those games. So grab your most rubbish controller, because when you die, the odds are you're gonna smash that bastard up. The weapon system in the game is pretty cool. Collect the disc things to keep upgrading your ship's power or speed. But if you hold down the fire button while collecting them, you can switch to new weapon sets, including a guided missile, secondary weapon, or the green disc of death that randomly flies around the screen killing everything. Another cool thing about the game is that your ship actually has weight and inertia in space, and it affects it, so it floats about quite a bit. It feels pretty good after a couple of goes. I really like it. The graphics are nice and cartoony and are animated really well and the variety in the enemies is quite significant. The levels look good too, although after about level 7 or so they all tend to look the same. The sound effects are really well done and have this nice chunky sound to them and makes it really satisfying when blowing things away. This game is also available on the C64 Mini with a whole bunch of other really cool Houston titles. So checking it out this way is probably the simplest if you haven't got an old 64 lying about. The Zap 64 magazine at the time gave this thing a whopping 90% in 1987. And although I like it, I think that's a bit much. Having said that, I'd still recommend giving this cool 80s shoot 'em up a try, especially if you've never played it before. Okay, for our next game, we're gonna jump ahead exactly one decade to 1997. Dodon Patchy was released by Cave in 1997 on the Sega Saturn and was Cave's second game release. Dodon Patchy was converted to the Sega Saturn from the arcade. It was a direct sequel to the arcade original Don Patchy, which was also a brilliant shoot 'em up game. Game was published by Atlas, but programmed by those Japanese maniacs at Cave, one of the most well known and respected shoot 'em up developers. They were formed in 1994 and comprised mostly of ex Coplan employees which itself was an arcade powerhouse company which went defunct in 1994. This may have only been Cave's second game, but damn did they get the bullet hell formula down so well. Later on they would go on to make classics like Pink Sweets, The Death Smile series and Akai Katana, amongst many many more fan favourites. 
But for now, let's jump back to the bullet hell masterpiece. Straight off the bat, you get to choose between either two jets or a helicopter. The one jet sports a narrow shot, the other a spread shot, while the chopper has two side attacks for extra death dealing. And of course, you always come equipped with a smart bomb for total screen destruction. And man, does this game dish out the destruction at a feverish pace. It's a relentless assault on the senses without a second to breathe, and it's just so damn satisfying. The game serves up six levels of mayhem, which doesn't sound like much, but it's actually the perfect amount for this style of game. If you've never heard the phrase of bullet hell shooter, then this game is a prime example of one, with a relentless stream of bullets that is constantly on screen and blowing the hell out of everything. Don Patchy, the prequel, is often cited as being the original bullet hell game. Cave couldn't have picked a more perfect system to release this game on as well, as the Saturn was known as a 2D powerhouse, and the game runs fantastically on the system. The graphics are chunky, but feel very robust, and the explosions and destruction is a treat for the hours, as is the sound effects for the years. The music is typical shooter fare for the time, and does a job fairly well, if nothing spectacular. And if you're feeling particularly skillful, there's a hidden 7th stage, but in order to open that, you have to complete the entire game with one credit. Good luck, soldier. And if you're a newbie to bullet hell games, fear not, because this Saturn version has a very easy, easy, normal, and hard mode, so it's a perfect game to get used to this shoot 'em up subgenre. I'll definitely be covering more games from this series in the future, but for now, search this Japanese Saturn release out now. You won't regret it. And our final game for today was released in 2012. Sinmora was released by Grasshopper Manufacturer in 2012 on the PC. Its original release was on the Xbox 360 a few months earlier. Sin Mora was a shoot 'em up co developed by two companies. One of them, Grasshopper Manufacturer, who you may know, is a Japanese company formed in 1998 by the head honcho, Suda51. And they are known for making some crazy cool games like Killer7, No More Heroes, and Lollipop Chainsaw, to name a few. And the other company, which you may not know, Digital Reality. They were a Hungarian company formed in 1991 and probably are best known for making the PC strategy games Imperium Galactica 1 and 2 and they unfortunately closed their doors in 2013. So then how did these two companies manage to make such a brilliant shoot 'em up especially considering this style of game was neither of their forte? The hell if I know. <laughs> so let's just jump into this classic and start playing and I'm sure it'll all be revealed. The first thing that strikes you about this game is the gorgeous 2.5D graphics that are absolutely stunning to look at. Every little detail in this crazy steampunk style universe is rendered to the highest quality. An unusual feature for this type of game is the story, which is dark to say the least, and involves genocide, persecution, revenge, and is laid on thick. It's also told from multiple character perspectives, which also serves as the switching point for vehicles, giving slight variety in the gameplay from chapter to chapter. Just like in Zarnaps earlier, the levels are not too long and culminate in a gigantic boss battles. And for me, these are the highlights of this awesome game. Giant mech submarines, fortress-like trains, and giant mechanized cannons are just a few of the examples. This game features another interesting element, which is the time feature, which has two parts to it. First, your energy is time, which is constantly ticking down. So every enemy you shoot down adds it back up, or vice versa. And the second time element is that you can slow down time to deal with mass bullet dodging and maneuvering sequences for limited periods. Both elements work exceptionally well and makes this game quite different from the previous two titles we looked at. And let's not forget the epic soundtrack here too, composed by longtime grasshopper manufacturer collaborator Akira Yamaoka, best known for the Silent Hill soundtracks, and my personal favorite, the Shadow of the Dam music. It's a much more understated score this time around than he usually does, but adds a ton of atmosphere to the grim story and settings. And even though this review is based on the original version of this game, you can also pick up the 2017 Sin More EX on all modern consoles and play the definitive version of this future classic. This for me is also another great entry level shooter for newbies to the genre, so please give it a go. It's an amazing game that will continually wow you from chapter to chapter, guaranteed. And that's a wrap today for the first episode of Shoot'em Up Decades. I hope you enjoyed it. The three games we showed, I hope it showed the variety of the Shoot'em Up genre in general. Most people think the Shoot'em Up genre is just one tone, but it really isn't. There's a lot of different styles of gameplay involved. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of Shoot'em Up Decades. If you could like and subscribe, that would be greatly appreciated. And cut to credits.
Hey, Bastish B here for 64K, and welcome to the second episode of Shoot 'em Up Decades. And welcome back. If you've never watched this show before, I take three different shoot 'em up games from three different decades and we check them out. And at the end, we'll discuss what cool features each one of these games managed to bring to the genre. So for our first game, we're gonna jump back in time to when arcades were at their peak. UN Squadron was released in the arcades in 1989 by Capcom, who was one of the major players in the arcade scene at the time. 89 was right in the heart of their most productive arcade period, and the game lived up to the high standards brilliantly. Capcom was formed in 1979, and was a combination of a few companies set up by the founder, Kenzo Sujimoto. It eventually received the Capcom name in 1983. The name, if you didn't already know, is a shortened version of two words, Capsule Computers. Capcom, which the company came up with to describe the early arcade scene which they were a major player in. Arcades remained their primary format in the early days, but they eventually branched out into consoles with the release of the Famicom in 1984. And the rest, as they say, is history. Capcom wasn't new to the shoot 'em up genre at all, having already made notable games in the genre, such as Legendary Wings and Forgotten Worlds, so they had good experience in this style, which was released on their powerhouse CPS arcade hardware that was used extensively during that period. The game was based on a Japanese manga called Area 88 and was renamed UN Squadron for Western audiences who were no doubt unfamiliar with that series. English versions of some of that series were released through Viz Comics and I highly recommend you checking them out. They are pretty good reads. This is also a rare shoot 'em up for the time that actually has a bit of a story and plays out traditionally between the levels and has a group of pilots trying to take down the secret terrorist group known as Project 4. This game ticks all the horizontal shoot 'em up cliches while bringing the unique aspect of an energy bar instead of a one hit kills or losing all your weapons which was pretty much the standard for every shooter during this period. Being able to take a number of hits made the game way more accessible to casuals as well, but that didn't mean the game was easy. It's still a tough little bastard, but with the energy bar and the relatively short levels, it made it possible to at least survive for more than 5 minutes before slapping in another quarter. Being able to purchase weapons at the end of each level was very cool as well, and that had definitely been lifted from Capcom's previous shooter hit Forgotten Worlds. Overall, there are 10 levels to blast through and 3 unique characters to choose from straight out of the manga. Shin has forward fire only, but at a rapid pace. Marky's ones are slower but do way more damage, and Greg has small forward shot but he also has a secondary low firing shot weapon that takes out ground targets. Choosing what style suits you is pretty tough, but Shin is my usual choice having been a pretty well rounded character. Each level is pretty short as previously mentioned, and ends with the traditional boss battle taking the form of a giant tank, stealth bombers, castle fortresses, and many more other crazy things. The graphics are excellent and have that very unique CPS hardware look that is part anime, part 16-bit sprite goodness, and it still looks great even playing it now. It's complemented by a cool soundtrack by Minami Matsume, who was no slouch in the music department, having composed Mercs and Magic Sword soundtracks amongst many more at Capcom. We never got to see a proper sequel despite the game being very popular at the time, but Capcom's 1990 release called Carrier Airway is often considered the spiritual successor to this game, sharing more than a few similarities, combined with look and style that also makes it a must-play shooter. The easiest way probably to play this game now is picking up the excellent Super Famicom or Super NES versions, which are both extremely well-made arcade gun versions. If you've never played this 1989 game, then there's no better time to dive into this often overlooked CPS system gem. And our next game for today, we're going to jump back to the console walls of the 90s and check out a much loved classic. Yeah, 
Aerofighters, which is known as Sonic Wings in Japan, was released in the arcades in 1992 by Video System, and we'll be looking at the Super NES version that was released a year later in 1993. Of note, the Super NES version is a variation on the arcade and is not a direct port. The developer Video System was founded in 1984 and were defunct by 2001. Their offices were in Kyoto, Japan. They primarily made games for the arcade scene, while also later they made console games on the Super NES and then the Neo Geo. Most of their games didn't leave Japan and they are best known for their F1 Grand Prix series on the Super Famicom and obviously the Aero Fighter series. Shin Nakamura, the designer of Aero Fighters and many other video systems games, ended up leaving the company after Video System wanted to start developing the second and eventually third game in the series exclusively for the Neo Geo arcade system. Shin was fed up and he left and he ended up founding Seiko, which is an excellent shoot 'em up company whose first game was the brilliant Samurai Aces. So it all worked out well for our shoot 'em up fans. Aero Fighters was a game I played a lot in the arcades initially, and it has all the vertical scrolling cliches intact. They were brought over to the Super NES version with the rapid fire destruction and the classic smart bomb intact. Character wise, you pick the nation you want to represent, like the USA, Japan, Sweden, and the UK, all with their own unique weapon styles. What's even more unique here is that each nation has two members two different characters, one for player one and one for player two, so it was clearly a game that was always designed for two player action. And it also bumps up the character count to eight, which was a lot back then. The stages are also set by which character you choose, so there is an element of variation as you try out all the characters. The game sports seven stages in total, with each having two parts, and the diversity in the stages is pretty good and gives it a great international flavor and feel. The graphics are also pretty well done, and the Super NES version does an excellent imitation of the arcade. As is the music and sound effects. This is a good shoot 'em up without being brilliant, but I wanted to highlight this series as I want to cover all three games eventually, and it's definitely worth playing if you're a fan of the traditional style shooter genre. And if you're wondering how to play this, probably emulation is your best bet at this point, as the Super NES version is extremely rare and super expensive. Don't even bother looking, you'll give yourself a heart attack. And for our third and final game for today, we're gonna to jump to a time when Microsoft and Sony completely dominated the home console scene. Castle Shikigami 2 was first released in the arcade in 2003 on Sega's Naomi Arcade System by the company Alpha System, and in 2004 it was ported to the PS2, which is the version we're looking at today. Before we get to the game, let's check out Alpha System, the Japanese software company from Kumamoto, Japan. They were formed in 1988 and initially did games exclusively for NEC consoles like the PC Engine. They eventually branched out and worked on many handheld versions of Namco's Tales of RPG series before the Castle Shikigami trilogy. Even though Castle Shikigami 2 was the first time that the series was released under its original name in English, we did see the original on the PS2 as well, under the awfully changed name Mobile Light Force 2, and the even more dismal US cover art, which I actually passed up before thinking it was some dodgy third person budget game. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> the story goes that this giant castle suddenly appears above Tokyo and triggers the battle between humans and gods. This is another well-made fun vertical shooter that's a pretty good entry-level game for newbies to the genre. It does get a bit bullet helly, <laughs> but totally manageable. First up, there's a massive selection of characters to choose from, eight in total, each with their own unique magic styles, and each character has their own storyline as well, and the interactions with the bosses all differ accordingly. The game is also pretty easy to get into, and learning how to use the score system which rewards you for being dangerous and getting close to incoming bullets without being hit. It's not a new concept but this kudos system always reminds me of the risk reward trope that I first saw in Metropolis Street Racer on the Dreamcast. The game is spread across five levels with each level being split in two parts with a mid level and final boss for each. I really like the structure as it gives you a sense of how far you are in any given level. The graphics are really good, well animated and complement the anime style of the game perfectly. Music and sound effects are also pretty good as well but the voice servers are a Resident Evil train wreck that are so bad they're good. The actors or the people that they hired to do the voiceovers don't seem to have a clue what they are talking about. Hi, what a cute boy. Interested in my body, aren't you? Or even the context of what is being said. A. Beaten and then get caught. Or B. Caught and then get beaten. You're an idiot! Let me finish you! 
and the translation is hilariously bad. I am Dundian, keeping it a full free zone. It actually makes the game better in my opinion. The gameplay and everything else is an absolute blast anyway, but having this extra layer of cheese brings tons of humor to the story, even though it was clearly unintentional. I'm not taking excuses. I'm beating you down. The European PS2 release has all the voiceovers removed, obviously due to some sort of quality control, which in my opinion is a bit of a shame. You should definitely check out the US version if you get a chance. In 2005, Alpha released the third and final game in the arcades, and it received an English Wii release in 2008. This is a cool fun shooter for the PS2 that's as fun to play as it is to witness the mad, unintentionally ridiculous dialogue. So why did I choose these three shoot 'em ups? Each one of them I think has something a little bit unique that's a little bit different, especially for the time. Number one, UN Squadron. This one has an energy bar, which wasn't very common back then. So it made it a lot more easier to get into for anybody really. So it was a kind of an innovation I felt at the time. Secondly, it was based on a manga. So it gives the whole game a lot more character than you would usually see in a shoot 'em up at that time or any time really. So it felt like a little bit of like a, its own little universe and these characters were existing in it as opposed to just a random ship flying along and just shooting stuff. I chose Aero Fighters because of its massive cast of characters and the international flavor of it. All the levels are pretty diverse. Uh, I like all the different types of characters from all different countries. It made it feel like a little bit more of a, like an epic battle against something. And even though the Super Nintendo version wasn't a direct arcade port, it did such a great job of capturing the arcade so well, even in look and style, that I think it really deserves a second look. And lastly, I chose Castle Shikigami 2 because of the ridiculous story. It is like so much fun to play this game and witness the absolutely terrible translation that was made of this game. Now obviously the reason it's here is because it is a really good shoot 'em up gameplay wise. It's super fun to play. Uh, I haven't played like a shoot 'em up that is just like absolute fun. Like so much fun as this one is. But the English translation is so bad, it just has to be seen to be believed. <laughs> Um, and it's so much fun, you really should play through with all the characters or at least sample them because you're going to be in for like some of the most hilarious dialogue you have ever seen in a game of all time. <laughs> and that's a wrap for another episode of Shoot'em Up Decades. Thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. If you could like and subscribe, they'll be greatly appreciated and I'll see you next time. Cheers! <laughs>
style of game design and producer Yoshiki Okamoto, whose previous game before this was the excellent Time Pilot. But after the release of Garus, he left Konami for Capcom, and there he designed and produced countless classics such as 1942, Final Fight, Street Fighter 2, and many more, before resigning from Capcom in 2003 and forming his own company. The turnaround for home ports was pretty rapid back then, and Garus appeared everywhere, including the Atari 2600, Commodore 64, ColecoVision, NES, and that's just to name a few. The game's plot has you trying to make your way back to Earth. Every stage gets you one planet closer. The game plays like Galaga, with streams of bad guys flying in and taking position in formation as you blast away at them. The difference is you can move 360 degrees around the whole screen blasting them from all angles. The game employs a pretty good fake 3D look that works pretty well and was really impressive at the time. I was lucky enough to have this machine in my local cafe close to where I lived as a kid, right next to the commando cabinet, and subsequently played this a ton back then in its original form. Besides the aliens that you are blasting, there are also invincible asteroids to avoid, and also alien satellites that are attacking you, and if you kill them, you get the much needed weapons upgrade. Bonus stages kick in once you reach the next planet, which are really fun shooting galleries where dying is not possible. And if you've been wondering why I've been playing the classical music score Tokata and Fugu in D minor, ba ba. Well, it's actually the game's soundtrack, which is a bizarre choice, but it works so well in this game, and used to have me humming this piece all the way home after blowing all my quarters. This is a classic and simple arcade game that you should definitely try if you haven't already. It's available on the Xbox 360 Arcade, the PS1 Konami Arcade Classics Compilation, or the excellent Konami Collector's Series Arcade Advance on the GBA if you want some portable blasting action. And next up we got a shoot 'em up from the early days of the Sega Mega Drive. Musha was released in 1990 by Compile exclusively for the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis. Musha was a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up that definitely looked different from the rest. But before we get into that, let's take a quick look at the company that made it. Compile was formed in 1983 and eventually shut its doors in 2003. They were formed by Masamitsu Nitani and predominantly did shoot 'em ups in the 80s and more puzzle based games in the 90s like the Puyo Puyo games for Sega. In the early days, just like Konami, they focused on the Japanese computer, the MSX, where they created Xanak and Alast, two very well received shoot 'em ups. They also formed a long lasting relationship with Sega and ported games like Borderline and NSUB to Sega's SG-1000 console. Sega in turn offered to make their Puyo Puyo puzzle game into an arcade machine and it proved a massive success in Japan. And back to Musha, just like all shoot 'em ups it has a totally irrelevant plot involving a mega computer that's threatening Earth's destruction, you know the usual nonsense. But the present the presentation of the story is very cool and is inspired by all the awesome anime and manga of the time and is really really well done. Musha is technically part of the LS shoot 'em up series that Compile started on the MSX and was actually going to be called LS2 until they decided to give it its own identity. Although the style has been done a million times since 1990, Musha's mixture of ancient Japan and mech designs was really quite unique for the time. It may not be the first game to mix these styles but for me it really stood out visually. You have your usual selections of upgrades like lasers, explosives and shield effects which you can pick up during the levels. And if you pick up the same weapon twice in a row it upgrades it. There's also these weird coke can things that are flying about and if you shoot a bunch of them you acquire mini drones which come and help you and they can be moved around on screen to different formations to suit the current action. And just like the Super NES classic XLA, every time you get hit you lose a piece of your weaponry until the final kill shot. Another cool aspect of this game is the music by Toshiaki Sakoda which are these really fast paced almost metal inspired tunes that that really sync up well with the action. Sometimes with shooters I feel the soundtrack gets a little bit lost in all the destruction, but in this one it's very much the heart of the action in every way. If you like his music you should also check out his great soundtracks to Spree Gun and Treasure Hunter G for more musical goodness. This game is just one of the many excellent exclusive shoot 'em ups on the Mega Drive slash Genesis that I'm going to cover in future episodes. You should also check out Compile's shoot 'em up back history catalog. You won't be disappointed. And for our third and final game for today we're going to jump right into the middle of a classic console's life cycle and check out a real gem.
Mars Matrix was developed by Takumi and released in 2000 in the arcades by Capcom. It was swiftly ported to the Dreamcast for a 2001 release. As I mentioned in episode 1 of this series, Toplan, a massive Japanese arcade company, went bust in 1994, but out of those ashes, many new shoot 'em up companies formed from all the ex employees. We already looked at Cave in the last episode. But another excellent company that was created was Takumi, who made their headquarters in Shinjuku, Tokyo. Takumi wasted no time, and by 1995 they started pumping out excellent arcade shoot 'em ups, not only for themselves, but for other companies as well, like Taito and Capcom. Some of their most well known games were Twin Cobra 2 and Geiger Wing 1 and 2. Mars Matrix appeared right near the middle of Takumi's life cycle. The story for the game is your standard shoot 'em up nonsense involving Mars setting up an army and rebelling against Earth. So we have to send a lone fighter to crush the rebellion and kill the leader. Like I said, standard shoot 'em up nonsense. <laughs> Story aside, this game delivers in every other way and then some. You get your choice of two different ships in the game. The red one has high speed, a cool spread shot, but lower damage output. The blue one on the other hand has a slower speed, but rapid straight laser shots that do much more damage overall. The choice is yours. As soon as you start this vertical shooter, you'll realize you are in bullet hell bliss. The fast paced destruction does not let up for a second and had me hooked immediately when I started playing this initially. The simplicity of the gameplay is what really did it though. The A button does almost everything. Rapid fire regular shots quick close range shotgun blasts, being able to suck in all your opponent's bullets and blast them back at them, or just charging up fully and then just blowing up everything on the screen. It's so simple and only takes a game or two to get comfortable with the whole setup. We have 6 levels of mayhem to blast through as you try to chop down the rebels and take out the bosses, who are tricky but not too tough. Even though the bullets are flowing like crazy, I felt like I always had a chance at dodging everything, which is not something you can usually say for games in the genre. You also don't pick up weapons in this game, but instead you pick up these experience cubes from killing stuff, which upgrades your weapon's power. The graphics do employ that mid to late 90s silicon graphics rendered look that was very popular at the time, and they are definitely an acquired taste. The destruction animation and sheer amount of stuff happening always made up for it in my box. It's a good looking game, don't get me wrong, it just looks a little bit dated when played in retrospect. The music is your usual Japanese arcade pair. It works well and has some good toe tappers in the mix. The Dreamcast version also sports a host of extra modes and added content that definitely prolongs the life of the slightly short shooter. It's just a pity we never got to see a sequel. Takumi went defunct in 2009 unfortunately, so all the more reason to give this one a blast. It's well worth it. Game over. So why was Garus here? Well, it's an early Konami game which is always cool to look at. It has, you can fly around the screen 360 degrees. I know there were games like that before, like Tempest and stuff. But it just employs this really cool like, fake 3D look that really like sucked me in when I played it originally. And it still plays really well. It's not just a gimmick, it actually does add a lot of cool stuff to the gameplay. And secondly, the soundtrack is just super unique using Bach's Toccata. It's really crazy, but when I used to play that back in the day, I just used to just get into my head and I really love it. So Musha is here because it employs this really cool mixture of like traditional Japanese style look mixed with robots and mech. It just gives the game a whole different look than anything else I'd played at the time. It still looks really good. The sprite work is fantastic in that game, so is all the parallax scrolling. The soundtrack too is pretty damn awesome. I'd never heard a game that used like a kind of a metal, like hard rock kind of sound in like infused into it that just uh, seemed to complement the game so well, even though it like was showing like traditional Japanese kind of stuff mixed with robots. Somehow it all works and it just it's a great game from a great series, the AVS series, that I want to cover more of also in the future. I wanted to show Mars Matrix because of the really simplicity of the gameplay. You basically just use one button for the most part for almost everything and it's just the way you use it and it reminded me of playing old games on older systems. It shows that you don't need to like have like 50 buttons to make a game better and uh, it plays really well. It takes a little bit to get used to, but it's just simplicity at its best. It's such a fun game too. Also like the unique style of it, the look of it, it's definitely something that's come and gone. You don't see graphics like that anymore just because uh, we've kind of moved on from that kind of look, that kind of late 90s look. But I still think, even though it's not to anybody's taste, I still think it looks kind of cool 
and it's definitely a game that needs to be checked out. And that's a wrap for another episode of Shoot 'em Up Decades. Thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. If you could like and subscribe, they'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hey, Bastish B here for 64K, and welcome to another episode of Shoot 'em Up Decades. Welcome back. If you've never watched this show before, I take a look at three different shoot 'em up games from three different decades. I tell you why I included them, why I like them, and what makes them unique. So let's first jump back to the 80s. Fighting its way through a plethora of arcade shoot 'em ups was Tiger Heli, released in 1985 by Toplan. Japanese software company Toplan was formed in 1979 and had their headquarters in Shimizu, Tokyo, Japan. They are most well remembered for their massive contribution to the shoot 'em up genre in the arcades right up to their bankruptcy in 1994. Many of their games were published by other developers overseas, but they actually made classics like Slapfight, Flying Shark, Truxton. Twin Cobra and so much more. Tiger Heli was a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up and Toplan's first game in this genre and pretty much set themselves up for what they did best right up to their closure. The team at Toplan took inspiration from an arcade game called Jarodan released a year earlier and used that as the basis for Tiger Heli. The game set itself apart from the glut of shooters at the time by having a much slower, more relaxed pace, which the team wanted to make it more inviting for new gamers to try it out. Even though you are flying a helicopter, you only ever fought ground targets, which was kind of weird, like tanks, boats, gun emplacements. No planes or helicopters attacked you. As per standard, even in 1985, a smart bomb is included for desperate situations. But unlike other games, it also acts as a form of defense, meaning if you have bombs available and a bullet hits you, it automatically activates, saving your life, blowing everything up on screen, but you losing a bomb in the process. I think it's a pretty unique concept, and I'm assuming the team implemented as another way to keep gamers happy, so you'll come back later to play it without walking away in frustration. Little mini helicopters can also be joined to boost your firepower, and if you died on a level, there were certain checkpoints the game would automatically restart you at. I loved this when I first played it as a kid. The graphics were so extremely colorful and detailed, and I really loved the small little details, like shooting the houses and the little puffs of smoke come out as you flew past them. This game's arcade board was later used in another slower paced shooter, Toplan developed called Slapfight, which is another great game in its own right. Two sequels were released later on named Twin Cobra in 1987 and Twin Cobra 2 in 1995 and are brilliant shoot 'em ups as well and I'm hoping that I'll be able to cover them in future episodes too. If you're new to the genre or just not a fan of those bullet hell operas, then give Tiger Heli a go and see the origins of Toplan's shoot 'em up legacy. Now let's jump to shoot 'em up heaven, the 90s. The mid 90s was the heart of shoot 'em up heaven in the arcades. In 1996, we saw the release of Batsugan on the Japanese Sega Saturn. It was based on Toplan's 1993 arcade bullet hell masterpiece, and the conversion to the Saturn was published by Banpresto. Banpresto themselves was formed in 1977, and during the 80s, under their original name, Corland, they made many arcade games, including the Sega 1982 classic Pengo. Banpresto's headquarters were in Shinagawa, Tokyo, and they were probably best known as a toy company and doing many Japan exclusive games such as the Super Famicom Robot War series and Macross Plus in the arcades. Batsugan was a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up taking place over five levels of bullet hell madness. You could choose between six characters plus three different ships that all had their own unique weapons layouts. What makes Batsugan unique was the RPG styled upgrade mechanic that the game 
Ben uses. As mentioned, each ship has two unique weapons plus the all-important smart bomb. But you don't pick up new weapons as per usual in these types of games. Instead, you pick up experience from down foes, which levels up your weapons for more powerful attacks. And once the weapons are maxed, the experience accumulates to give you extra smart bombs. As per usual, the bullet hell craziness ramps up real fast and becomes a chaotic ballet of death and it's just so satisfying to play. As is the giant boss characters which are so much fun to obliterate. The Band Presto Saturn release didn't just simply contain a port, but added a bunch of extra features to the Saturn version which features a completely new arranged soundtrack, plus the original. It also features the original arcade version, plus an exclusive Saturn version, which includes a modified smart bomb that destroys more of the screen. It takes way more hits also to down your ship, and unlike the arcade, the game loops after the final stage, with the difficulty increased, of course. The arcade version is seen as one of the first examples of the bullet hell subgenre, and this exclusive Sega Saturn version is a fantastic blast well worth tracking down. Now let's check out the 2000s. So jumping over to the 2000s, you're probably expecting a PS2 on an original Xbox game, but I've decided to feature 2005's Commodore 64 release of Metal Dust by Knights of Bats and released through Protovision. These are the same guys they would go on to make one of the Commodore 64's best platform games in which I featured in Platform Decades Episode 1. The game in question was Sam's Journey, a must-play game in that epic genre. Knights of Bats is a C64 publisher founded in 1997 by Chester Colston and made some other great fun C64 games like Askars and Bomb Mania in the late 90s. Metal Dust is an amazing horizontal shoot 'em up that has to be seen to be believed. I'll talk about how this game is possible on the C64 later, but let's first focus on the game itself. At first glance it's your standard shoot 'em up fair and doesn't really add anything new to the genre, but the technical aspect of it though is thoroughly amazing. There are only four levels which doesn't sound like much, but they are pretty massive in length and feature tons of mini bosses before the big end of the level encounters. If you're a veteran Commodore 64 user, you will no doubt notice that these guys were probably big fans of programmer Manfred Trends, who did Catechus, R-Top and Enforcer on the C64. The style of the graphics and the insane pace of the game reminds me so much of those classic games. Every level feels like an epic journey as it progresses and you feel like you're heading further and further down that rabbit hole. As per usual, the game features tons of power-ups and the classic charge shot just like in R-Top. The music is absolutely amazing as the game streams full digi music that just sounds fantastic and every track is a treat. In order to play this beast on a real C64, you're gonna need a super CPU with a RAM card with at least 4 meg of RAM. All this extra memory and features allows this game's music and insane graphics to exist. If that's unavailable to you, you can still play it in VAS as it supports the super CPU through emulation. And I suggest you check out Reset64 Fanzine issue number 11 as it gives you a full step-by-step -step process on how to get this game running. And it was the only way I was able to finally play this game once and for all. Overall, as a C64 shoot 'em up, it's one of the best. The fast pace and relentless action, really well designed stages and boss battles, and the fantastic graphics and sound design really shows what the C64 is capable of with just a little bit of a boost. Check this unique release out. As far as I know, it's the only Super CPU C64 game to exist. Okay, so why did I choose Tiger Heli? I think Tiger Heli for me was always a great entry level arcade game for anybody. You could go up to it, you didn't have to have a fistful of quarters to get anywhere. You could take just a handful, like two or three quarters and you can get really, really far in the game. It was like a much easier game to get into. I like the defensive smart bomb idea. I think it's very clever. It's just a really good, often forgotten shoot 'em up that's totally worth checking out. As for Batsugan, that was the first, or at least one of the first bullet hell games I'd ever played. The Sega Saturn version there is absolutely fantastic. It's definitely the best version you can go for that I've ever played anyway. It's got like so many extra features, it really adds to the game. You've got like almost two games in one, like variations on it. The two player mode was also excellent, I failed to mention it in the review. 
the difficulty is average, I would say uh, it definitely ramps up, but for a bullet hell game, it definitely uh, it's a lot easier than the usual ones, at least I find it a lot easier. Excellent music as well, so it's just a great all-round package. And as for Metal Dust, I just wanted to showcase something a little bit different. It's not just a Commodore 64, it's like a kind of a hopped up Commodore 64 game. It's one of the only super CPU games that I know of. Uh, there might be another one out there, maybe a few. I don't know, I've never heard of any, so this might be the only one. Whatever the case, it's a game that is well worth checking out. You're probably going to be playing it through Fast One Emulator, but that's just more practical these days to play that game. Anyway, I also, uh, in the review, I didn't mention that it, uh, it has an excellent two-player mode, which makes the game way easier. Also, the game is pretty damn hard. Uh, it starts off easy as per usual. It ramps up very quickly, and you're going to be getting destroyed. So, uh, if you're not into super hard games, then this might put you off a little bit. The graphics are really excellent, and that music is so pumping. Also love the way the sound effects and mixes in with the music. It just sounds so good. It's obviously got to do with the super CPU and the way they could uh, layer it or something. I'm not an expert on how it actually works, but it just sounds not like any Commodore 64 game I've heard before. It just has this kind of sound level where the sound effects and the music just kind of flow together. It's really cool. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. If you can like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. You choosing that one? Yeah, I'm choosing that guy. Okay, choose it. <laughs> you having fun? Yeah! Hey, Bastish Beer for 64K and welcome to another episode of Shoot 'em Up Decades. And if you've never watched this show before, I review three different shoot 'em ups from three different decades on any systems. And today I'll actually be joined by a guest, Mega Drew. Yeah, so we both started our channel at the same time. We're in the trenches together, fighting for that first 1,000 subs, which is super brutal. We used to comment on each other's videos. He's a good guy. He's recently restarted his channel and he focuses on mainly arcade stuff, also some console stuff, like countdown videos, really good stuff, so please check it out and give him a sub if you see what you like. He'll be contributing one review to this episode and I'll be doing the other two. So let's hit up that first decade, the 1980s. Jump back to 1988 for the release of Armalite on the Commodore 64. This horizontal scrolling space shoot 'em up was published by Thalamus, who were at the time predominantly a C64 game publisher that was formed as an offshoot to Zap 64 magazine. They had quite a streak from the get go in the shoot 'em up department with C64 hits like 1986's Sanction and 1987's Delta and Hunter's Moon. Armalite was developed by Sabadan Systems. It was their first and unfortunately last game. The team was made up of John Kemp on system programming, Dan Phillips on main programming duties, Robin Levy on graphics and level design, and Martin Walker on music and sound effects. Walker had previously worked on Hunter's Moon for Thalamus. The game was marketed in magazines as the sequel to 1987's Delta, but in retrospect it bared no resemblance to it in any way, shape or form. In many ways it's a traditional shoot 'em up, but if you look a little bit deeper, it's very unique and almost every 
everywhere. First off, the beautiful sparse graphics with their shiny metallic look really made the game stand out from other C64 shooters at the time. The deep thumping sound of Martin Walker's title screen music and the excellent unique sound effects immediately drew you into something altogether different. This was also a shooter that was player friendly, which was the opposite of the genre at the time. Dying meant only a small downgrade in weapons and you didn't have to restart the level from the beginning. It actually gave you a chance to get into the game and enjoy the experience without constantly restarting again and again and again. And here's a quote from graphics and level designer Robin Levy about that. A lot of single load games and even some arcade games had short levels and the player restarting at an arbitrary checkpoint, minus all his weaponry, which is a horrible way of extending a game's lifespan. So with Armalite we had the player restart immediately with a limited penalty on his arsenal, which meant that the player never got stuck on a single part of a level but would scrape through to see just a little bit further. It was a great philosophy and one of the big reasons I always came back to the game again and again. It comprised of 8 massive levels with this assortment of mid and end of the level bosses to deal with. It was also one or two players simultaneously which was an extremely fun way of playing it with a friend. Playing by yourself though was just as much fun with its excellent array of weapons and a simple and easy to use drone which hovered around your ship and you could manipulate into any position depending on the action. I played this game for countless hours always getting a little bit further each time which is one of its best features. I thought I'd finish this off with a quote from Dan Phil Phillips, lead programmer. We aimed incredibly hard and played it and played it, minor incremental revisions to the code and level design without any real regard for how long it was taking allowed us to craft the game. So check it out, it's one of the C64's best shooters. And now let's go on to the 90s. And now let's jump on over to the 90s for the 1994 DOS classic shooter Raptor Call of Shadows by Cygnus Studios and distributed by PC Legends a Pogi Software. Cygnus Studios were a PC computer games company from Chicago, Illinois. In the early 90s they teamed up with a Pogi and released this 2D vertically scrolling shoot 'em up gem. Their relationship with a Pogi was more than just Raptor. They also had their hands in a bunch of other classics like Duke Nukem 2, Blakestone and and many more. In the late 90s they renamed themselves Mountain King Studio and continued to publish their own games up until the late 2000s. Apogee up until that point was one of the few PC companies making console style platform games and action games on the PC so why not take a shot with a classic arcade style shoot 'em up. Nobody was doing them on the PC either so Raptor's development was well underway. Playing this game in DOS back then was a truly weird experience. PC, console and arcade games were so far removed from each other and to play an arcade arcade style shooter in DOS was an awesome experience and boy it didn't disappoint. The game is made up of three massive levels or sectors and each one of those has nine sub levels for an overall mass of 27 levels. It definitely bucked that arcade style trend. After the super cool intro you get to choose what sector you want to start in. Bravo is basically a great rookie training course. Tango is harder with more diverse variety in enemies and landscapes. And finally the outer regions has you traveling to other planets and is definitely the hardest of the bunch. All levels though are open to be replayed as much as you want, which leads to Raptor's more unique feature, at least for a shooter of that era, and that's mining for money. Points don't exist in this game, everything you shoot has a monetary value, which accumulates with every on-screen kill. After a mission you can blow all your cash at the local weapon shop and upgrade your ship. You definitely do need to do a bit of mining in this game to survive some of the harder levels, but the action is so much fun that I didn't really mind it. Also bear in mind that replaying levels you have completed means they automatically upgrade in difficulty, so be ready for it. The game features your usual array of mid bosses and end of the level bosses, plus every type of ground and ship based enemy you used to seen in this style of game. The harder the enemy is to kill, the more cash they are worth, or you can just nuke them with a mega bomb and be done with it. This game is such a blast to play from its awesome looking arcade quality 2D graphics to the excellent rocking soundtrack that has so many memorable tunes. 
The game eventually went on to sell between 80 and 90,000 copies, and the PC magazine of the day, Computer Gaming World, said in 1993 of the game, a Pogi's most professional and competent release. Raptor is currently available on GOG, good old games, on PC, which is an easy way of playing it for really cheap. If you're a console or arcade only gamer, you owe it to yourself to at least try this out. It's just a fantastic dive into 90s shoot 'em up action. And now over to Mega Drew. Daimahu, a bullet hell vertical scrolling shoot 'em up delivered by a combination of developer raising and publisher Capcom. This was one of the last arcade games released on Capcom's CPS2 hardware, and it's a festival of bullets, bombs, and bounty hunters. Raising took on previous employees of Toplan who went bankrupt in 1994. Toplan were masters of the shoot 'em up genre, and this trend continued with Raising as they delivered classics such as Battle Garriga and 1944 The Loop Master. Raising was incorporated into A Ting in 2000, and since then there has been less focus on shoot 'em ups. Daima Who was the sequel to 1993's Saucer Striker and 1994's Kingdom Grand. Prix. Kingdom Grand Prix was an interesting shoot 'em up that incorporated racing into the game. Daimahu features four selectable characters and four hidden characters that are accessed by using a code. Each character has an individual set of strengths and weaknesses, including speed, power, range, and bomb. The story sees an uprising of goblins from the depths of Earth. These goblins are taking over the world, and it's up to you to put a stop to them. The graphics are fantastic. And I just love the small details in the backgrounds, especially the crowds that gather to cheer you on. I was really impressed by Daima Who's soundtrack. Each stage has some awesome music, and this is accompanied by quality sound effects and speech. The gameplay is fast and smooth, with up to two players taking to the skies. You have a standard fire attack, and a choice between fire and ice magic which you can switch between during play. The fire and ice elements play a big part in the game, as certain enemies will be more or less vulnerable to each one. The boss battles are one of my favourite parts of the game, as you must focus your attacks on each part of the enemy to destroy it piece by piece. Daima Who is an awesome shoot 'em up, but it's also very difficult, and requires some thoughtful strategy if you're going to get through it. They were very serious in the intro when they asked the question, Are you great? <laughs> So why did I choose Armalite? Well the simple reason is, is that that game felt like an arcade game on the Commodore 64. What I didn't mention in the review is that gameplay wise, the way it moved, the way it made you feel when you're flying around, it felt exactly like an arcade game, it didn't feel very rigid, it just flowed extremely well. Also the fact that when you died you weren't brutalized, you know, they didn't like punish you and make you start all over again. Everything just seemed to flow forward, which was always a cool thing about that game. I just love it. The music and graphics are obviously fantastic, so it's definitely worth checking out. It's really hard to find any fault with Daimahu. It's a quality shoot 'em up packed with all of the elements that put it up there with the best. With no home ports available, it's sadly one of those games that has been ignored, and that's a real shame. If you're a fan of shoot 'em ups and haven't played it, make Daimahu the next one that you play. And as far as Raptor goes, it was a 90s arcade game on DOS, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you lived through the 90s and that style of game, PCs were mainly point and click adventures, heavy RPGs, just heavy games in general. Yes, there were lots of arcade games also, but it's not really what it was known for. You know, arcade games were arcade games, console games were console games, PC games were in their whole other bracket. But just playing that game on uh, DOS was just super cool. And it's not just because I was playing it on DOS, it really is a good shoot 'em up. It's got unique elements, you know, like the mining for money to upgrade your ship. You can save it all the time, so you're constantly upgrading yourself, which is kind of like PC mechanics, especially for the 90s. So it was different. Music is fantastic, everything about that game. It's also a cheap buy on GOG, so even if you're not a PC gamer, you should just check it out, it's totally worth it. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B, and Mega Drew for this episode of Shoot'em Up Decades. He will be joining me again for the next episode. We'll cover three more random shoot'em ups of equal excellence. 
If you can like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Mm -hmm.